Throughout the annals of history, the art of warfare has been deeply intertwined with the mastery of supply and support systems. From ancient civilizations to modern conflicts, the ability to efficiently provision and sustain armed forces has often decided the fates of battles and the outcomes of wars. Leaders who understood the complexities of mobilizing troops, maintaining supply lines, and adapting logistics to ever-changing conditions gained a critical edge over their adversaries. This unyielding importance of seamless supply and support remains as relevant today as it has been throughout the ages, defining the success of military operations. Colonel Ellington awoke at six that evening. He shaved and walked outside, the sun still high in the evening sky. He wondered what mission they'd have tonight. He was not a bitter man, but to have nearly a quarter of his crews, men with whom he had worked for two straight years, lost in a week, was a difficult thing to accept. It had been too long since his experience in Vietnam. He'd forgotten how terrible losses could be. His men could not stand down a day to mourn their dead and ease the pain, much as they needed to. They were being carefully rested. Standing orders gave them eight hours of sleep a day. Like night hunters, they slept only by day. They were making a difference, however. He was sure of that. Every night the black and green frisbees lifted off for some special target or other, and the Russians still had not figured a counter. The strike cameras mounted in each aircraft were bringing back pictures that the wing intelligence officers could scarcely believe but at such a cost. Well, the colonel reminded himself that one sortie a day was a lighter load than the other air crews were bearing, and that the close support crews were taking losses equal to his own. Tonight held another mission. He ordered his brain to occupy itself with that task alone. The briefings took an hour. Ten aircraft would fly tonight, two planes each at five targets. As commander, he drew the toughest. Surveillance indicated that Ivan had a previously unsuspected forward fuel dump at a position west of Wittenberg that was supporting the drive on Hamburg, and the Germans wanted it taken out. His wingman would go in with Durandals, and he'd follow with rock eyes. There would be no supporting aircraft on this one, and the colonel didn't want jammer aircraft to go in with him. Two of his lost birds had had such support, and the jamming had merely alerted the defenses. He examined the topographical maps closely. The land was flat. Not much in the way of mountains and hills to hide behind. But then he could skim at treetop level, and that was almost as good. He'd approached from the east, behind the target. There was a 20-knot west wind, and if he came in from leeward, the defenders would be unable to hear his approach until bomb release. Probably. They'd egress the area by heading southwest. Total mission time, 75 minutes. He computed his necessary fuel load, careful as always to allow for the drag of his bombs. To the bare-bones fuel requirements, he added five minutes on afterburner, in case of air-to-air -air combat, and ten minutes to orbit Bitburg for landing. Satisfied, he went off for breakfast. With each bite of toast, his mind ran through the mission like a movie, visualizing every event, every obstacle, every SAM site to be avoided. He randomly inserted the unexpected. A flight of low-level fighters at the target. What effect would this have on the mission? What would the target look like on this approach? If he had to make a second bombing pass, from what direction? Major Isley ate with his commander in silence, recognizing the blank look on his face and running through his own mental checklist.
They headed straight into East Germany for 50 miles before turning north at Rodno. Two Soviet mainstay aircraft were up, a good distance back from the border and surrounded by agile flanker interceptors. Staying well outside the effective range of their radar, the two aircraft flew low and in tight formation. When they screeched over main roads, it was always in a direction away from a course to their target. They avoided cities, towns, and known enemy depots where there might be sands. The inertial navigation systems kept track of their progress on a map display on the pilot's instrument panel. The distance to the target shrank rapidly as the aircraft curved west. They flashed over Wittenberg at 500 knots. The infrared cameras showed fueling vehicles on the roads heading right for the target area. There. At least 20 tank trucks were visible in the trees, fueling from underground tanks. Target in sight. Execute according to plan. Raj, acknowledged Shade 2. I have them visual. The Duke broke left, clearing the way for his wingman to make the first run. Shade 2's aircraft was the only one left with the proper ejector racks for the bulky hard target munitions. God! The Duke's display showed an SA-11 launcher right in his flight path, its missiles aimed northwest. One of his aircraft had learned the hard way that the SA-11 had an infrared homing capacity that no one had suspected. The Colonel reefed his aircraft into a hard right turn away from the launcher wondering where the rest of the missile battery's vehicles were. Shade 2 skimmed over the target. The pilot toggled off his bombs and kept heading west. The French-made Durandal weapons fell off the ejector racks and scattered. Once free, they pointed down, and rockets fired to accelerate the munitions straight at the ground. It was the next thing to a nuclear detonation. Three white columns of flame rocketed into the air, spreading like fountains and dropping fuel for hundreds of yards. Every vehicle in the compound was engulfed in flame, and only those men near the perimeter escaped with their lives. Rubber fuel bladders brought to the site exploded a few seconds later, and a river of burning diesel and gasoline spread through the trees. In a matter of seconds, 20 acres of woods were transformed into a fireball that raced skyward, punctuated by secondary explosions. Ellington's fighter rocked violently as the shockwave passed. Damn, he said quietly. The plan called for him to use his cluster munitions to ignite what the Durandals had burst open. Don't think the rock eyes are necessary, Duke, Isley observed. Ellington tried to blink away the dots as he turned away, keeping as low as he could. He found himself flying right down a road. The Soviet commander-in-chief of the Western Theater was already angry, and what he saw to the east didn't help. he just conferred with the commander of the 3rd Shock Army at Zarentin to learn that the attack had again bogged down within sight of Hamburg. Furious that his most powerful tank force had failed to achieve its objective, he'd relieved its commander on the spot and was returning to his own command post. Now he saw what could only be one of his three major fuel depots rising into the clear sky. The general cursed and stood, pushing aside the roof panel on his armored command vehicle. As he blinked his dazzled eyes, a black mass seemed to appear at the lower edge of the fireball. What's that? Ellington wondered. His TV display showed four armored vehicles in a tight column. One of them, a SAM launcher. He flicked his bomb release controls to armed and dropped his four rock eye canisters, then turned south. His tail mounted strike cameras recorded what followed. The rock eyes split open, distributing their bomblets at a shallow angle across the road. They exploded on impact. Sink West died a soldier's death.
Four bomblets fell within a few meters of his vehicle. Their fragments sliced through the light armor, killing everyone inside even before its fuel tank exploded. Adding another fireball to a sky that had still not returned to darkness.